All right, so we'll we'll make a start because uh, I think we're about on time, and uh, I'm still not quite sure how long this will go, but we've got some flexibility at the end. So, um, good morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. Uh, it's going to feel a bit strange, I think, because I'm coming in fresh now. It's 9 a.m. here. I've had some sleep, although I was up early for a few sessions. Um, and I imagine there's some people here now getting very tired. So <laughs> I'll try and try and be uh, easy to follow. Um, if we haven't met before, my name is James McNally. I'm a LabVIEW champion, LabVIEW architect, uh, embedded developer. Uh, and basically, I work for myself uh, as a consultant at Wireshead Technology, where I primarily um, build custom instruments uh, for companies, whether that's for sort of R&D testing or um, actual product development, like early prototypes for people. So that's the kind of background I come from. Um, that may sway some opinions I have uh, as we go through. Uh, there we go. Um, so the giants are female. If you, you've probably seen a few slides now, uh, just highlighting some of the women in in engineering. And it's interesting. I went back and I, you know, I think, oh, all the ones I sort of know from history have gone, and then. Um, I've been done done before, and then I came across uh, this woman, Dr. Ozak Isu. I have I've got that right. Um, as a younger example, so she actually uh, graduated from Loughborough University, which is where I studied, which is where I came across her name uh, with a PhD, um, and she's now a technical lead for um, a building research institute. So she's she's leading research into things like smart homes. And she's originally from Nigeria, and uh, as with, I met a few people while at university from Nigeria, and it was very interesting to see the passion they've got for engineering, just because of you know seeing problems with the infrastructure uh, back at home. And she's been up for all sorts of awards, Chartered Engineer of the Year 2020 in the UK. She was the IET Young Woman Engineer of the Year in 2017. So she's really been making uh, waves. And uh, yeah, I think it's really interesting to see people. You know, at the start of their career as well as uh, looking back a long way. But today I'm going to talk about computer science, not buildings. Uh, we're going to talk about futures and promises. So there's really three parts to this presentation. Um, the first is I am going to try and convince you all that futures and promises is a worthwhile exercise. I'm actually just going to put my desk up to stand because it feels a bit more natural talking to you. Um, this is the really important bit of this presentation. <laughs> I really want you to see some value in these by the end of this, because that, that's what I want to get out of this. I think this is a really interesting concept for LiveV. Then I'm going to show you a library I've worked on as an implementation. I think it's a really, it could be a really valuable library, so I want to kind of get some feedback uh, and, and see what you think. But uh, you know, if someone else does one better, I, my goal here isn't to be the, the owner of Futures and LabVIEW is just to give some idea of what it will look like. And then I've got some fluffy slides at the end where we can discuss different aspects of the design, depending on how we're doing for time and things like that as we go. And I wanted to do some credits first, because if I put them at the end, we get distracted and we don't do them. So um, yeah, this, this is not a new concept in LabVIEW. This is inspired by working in languages like JavaScript, like Rust. Uh, like C-sharp, where uh, these are already language features. Um, and credit must be given to uh, Dr. James Powell, if you saw his uh, Messenger presentation at all. Um, they're the first time I saw these in LabVIEW. His, his Messenger framework actually has an implementation of these features. Um, and it's worth calling out John McBee. Unfortunately, his presentation yesterday clashed with uh, the other presentation I was giving. Uh, so I wasn't able to see exactly what he's covered, but he's <laughs> basically had the same title. So um, it'll be interesting to compare notes afterwards. Uh, and it's great to see someone else has picked up on this idea, because it means I'm not just uh, chasing a dead end. So I'm going to talk about futures will be the main word that I use. Um, futures, promises, deferred values. Um, there's another one which is, escapes me now, are all synonyms for the same concept. And this is the way that I would define it. It's a placeholder for the result of an operation uh, or a task, you could say, that will be completed at some unknown time 
<laughs> and actually there's an important bit in the, in the in the future we're assuming time goes forward um so there's a few really important things here so the, the, the first thing is it's a placeholder so it's um it's going to be quite reference based because the idea is it's this place in our software that we say there will be a value here when you're ready for it um an operation so this is really about uh, depending on how you want to call it asynchronous uh, tasks so it's about getting something done which has some natural kind of inputs and outputs and completed it at an unknown time and that is the really important thing here and that's where i think that versus other techniques that we already have in labu today adding some language around futures allows us to understand and, and kind of work with this idea that it's going to be completed at an unknown time in the future. So let me give you a bit of context because the, the reason this came on my radar and, and others is that this has been a major add to most mainstream languages in say the past five or 10 years. Um, C Sharp's added them, like we say, JavaScript has added them. Uh, I think C++ is adding them in the next revision, which I think is this year. Um, they're popping up everywhere. So it's worth talking about why that is. Well, a lot of other languages have struggled with taking advantage of multi-processing, uh, multi-processes, you know, concurrency, something that we take for granted, ironically, in LabVIEW. Um, it is quite a heavyweight process. Now, let, let me rephrase that. Basically, they want to give shortcuts to being able to take advantage of concurrent programming without having to dramatically change the structure of the code. And so what they've often done, and there's variations between languages, but the basic idea often is you have your, your thread, your function, and they add an asynchronous uh, runtime component of some form, and, and obviously that varies between languages. But the idea is normally with a bit of extra syntax, you can, instead of calling a function directly within your function, you can make a call an asynchronous function, which makes a request and returns one of these futures. And then that future is handled in parallel or very efficiently, um, so that then when it's ready, your function can continue on. And what the, one of the big driving forces behind this is the web. So if you've got a web server that needs to handle you know, 100 connections at the same time, then having each connection have one thread, you know, one core of your CPU locked up um, is going to be wasteful. Because half the time in a web application, you're waiting. You're waiting for a database response or something like that. Um, so this allows you know, even Node.js, which is single threaded, to handle um, many, many connections at a time. And so that's the driving force, but we don't do that in LabVIEW. So why should we still care about this? Um, very simply, we like asynchronous programming in some form of parallels of queued message handler type structure. I'm going to try and stay framework agnostic, but you know this is DQMH, this is Active Framework, this is you know many people spinning up their own uh, QMH type um, structures. So we do a lot of asynchronous programming. And I think that futures may help us simplify some of this, uh, simplify some of the comprehension around this. Um, so simplicity is one of them. The other benefit we should be able to see is performance because really right now you have two options actually there's, there's two things to tackle so one option is you send a request to your other dqmh module and at some point in the future it's going to send you a message back and the problem with that is it's really you've potentially got a lot of state to handle there it's going to make the code more complex the other thing you can do is what we've got on the screen here which is you start to have messages with request and reply um, so you're, let's say you need to um, take a measurement from a DC supply and get some details of the status from a unit under test. 
Well, the problem with the request and reply is performance. We're going to make a request to DC supply loop and await for some amount of time while it takes the measurement and get our response. And then we're going to go and make a request to the unit under test and then come back. What futures should allow us to do is actually fire off. And I've been trying to improve this slide a little bit. I appreciate there's just arrows everywhere, but I'll try and talk you through it. That allows us to go to the DC supply loop and say, we'd like a value and then hold a future for when that's completed. And then also the same, as soon as we've got that future, we can go and request the UUT comms loop. So we want a value and we get a future. And now the important bit is these two are now running in parallel. And we can just wait until both are completed. So you're going to see, this is where you're going to see performance benefits in LabVIEW, is if you have these cases where you're having to do kind of request reply to uh, multiple loops at, at one time. Uh, so, are there any questions at this stage? I realize I've probably thrown quite a lot in there in only uh, 10 minutes. Nothing coming up. Okay. So, we'll get more concrete in a minute, and I imagine there might be a few things that, that, that apply. Um, so, so let's talk about um, a bit of structure and a bit of language. Um, so Gab Gabriella said, why, why wait for the response from the DC supply loop? So this really depends on the different ways um, to, um, to get this data back from another asynchronous process. So if this was just a driver, it would just happen in line anyway. If you need a response back from that loop, then really this, like I said, if you don't wait, the other thing you have to do is just get a message back at some time in the future anyway. And the way that I've normally seen that done nowadays is then it's another message back to your loop. Now the problem is that now there's this like indeterminate, not indeterminate, sorry, intermediate state where you've made the request and you haven't got the response. So what do you do in the middle? If you start getting other messages, do you handle them? Do you pause everything until you have a response? Um, for me, the request response model here is a much simpler way of handle those, those uh, places. Yes, actually, James Powell just comments as well. You also don't know what order they come back in, and then you have to handle that. So if we did these as instead of waiting for response, we just put both these requests, and it was going to send back a message at some point in time, then we don't know who will come back to us first, the DC supply or the unit under test. And so then you have to have some extra programming logic to handle that. You have to, you know, when you get the DC supply response, you'll say, have we already had a response from the unit under test, and vice versa. So you, you get, uh, you know, some, um, <laughs> just the programming logic uh, becomes much more complicated because now it's about timing. And timing isn't visible uh, on the, the block diagram with these kind of asynchronous loops. And Eric asks about, uh, yeah, request response. If you do request response, why would you need futures? If you've only got one, loop you're talking to, then request response and futures are going to do exactly the same thing. Where futures are going to help is where you can then fire off two requests, you know, start this processing in parallel, and then have responses at the end. Uh, and then, yes, yeah, so Ollie, uh, so future could be something like a dedicated message queue, which is written by the DC supply and can re read the latest point in time. Yes. <laughs> so hold that thought as we start to look at implementation. Uh, but exactly one of the things that I hope you'll take away from this is I'm going to show you is nothing clever in terms of the technology and the fundamentals that we have in LabVIEW anyway. Um, what this is really about is wrapping some language and a design around it. 
uh, Fab, I haven't addressed call and collect. Um, yeah, actually, you know what? I didn't put it in the slides, and I was going to, and I, I, I just forgot about it, I guess. Um, call and collect is a, is, is a similar concept. So in call and collect, the call is the request, and the collect acts like reading our future. Um, so again, it's te the technology is there. I think where call and collect fails a little bit is the API design. So instead of getting something that you could call a future back, you just get a VI reference. Um, but again, yeah, technologically, exactly the same concept. <laughs> uh, what I really want to put around this is, is, is some language, I guess. And so, Cool. So, um, a few questions there. So, futures and promises. I, I, when we come back to design choices, I'll come back to this terminology, and I'll probably talk to you through the demo. This is the most common terminology that is seen in modern languages. So, I've used it because that's what I'm familiar with. Um, they kind of represent the same thing, and I do wonder about needing both terms. But essentially. We can see future and a promise as two sides of the same coin. Uh, so future is a placeholder for the requester to check for data. So when we start a task, um, we get a future for that task, and we can read, poll, we'll, we'll see that side of it in a minute, uh, for data. A promise is the kind of the other side of that that's seen by whatever's performing the task. Um, so that's the placeholder for the worker to fill it out with a result. And this is one important thing which we don't get natively anywhere in LabVIEW, which I think is a, a useful addition, is that promise can actually have two different outcomes. You can fulfill it with a result where the, whatever the task is has been successful. And or, sorry, you can fail it with an error. So if that task is unsuccessful for some reason, we need some error feedback for that. And so I sat down and thinking, okay. I guess you're weird. Yeah, sorry, I just saw that question coming through. The order of fulfilled promises is not based on the order of the request. Is that correct? Um, so the... One of the benefits of the futures is, I, I think, is that every time we make a request, we get a new future. So future is, um, I want to say ephemeral, there's a better word for that, has a very limited lifetime. So order becomes unimportant because you can do with it what you want. Every time you make a request, you get a future. So if you care about the order, you can keep them in an ordered array. If you don't care about the order, you can store them in whatever way you want. Um, so for each task, for each request, we get a future that only exists for the lifetime of that task. And James asks, does the future promise terminology division really add intuitive value? Uh, I'll come back to that, James. <laughs> I'm not certain is the short answer. Um, but I think there is a bit of value in there. Um, so, basic requirements. We need an interprocess holder of a single value or error. Uh, we are talking about um, speaking between loops. It's got to be something that's safe to use across processes. The reader must know if it's completed or not. So this is an element of synchronization. Um, and what I really mean by this is it kind of rules out using, say, global variables. Um, well, there's lots of reasons to rule out global variables for this, but that would be one example. When we come to um, see what the future holds, which is an interesting term, uh, <laughs> we need to know whether that value is completed or whether it, you know, it's just a value that's hanging around or a default value or something like that. Once written and read, it is destroyed. So this comes back to what I was saying before. For a task, there's a future. Once that task is complete, the future no longer exists. And that makes sure we don't read the same one twice. Uh, it allows us to 
have a level of control over you know some of these questions about ordering about yeah priorities things like that um so so that that's quite important efficient waiting for resolution so if we need to um the, you know the performance gain is that we free up threads basically if we're going to block a thread waiting for that resolution to complete then we've not gained very much um and because of that use case i've shown you with performance waiting on multiple futures i think is a really important feature i'm just seeing questions from so also we have to think for lambda functions so yes i, I think you're right Zoltan. i'll be perfectly honest i'm not 100 percent uh up to speed with lambda functions i'm bare basically aware of their importance to functional programming and functional programming is where this all really originated um now i suspect i don't know what we're looking at here will be quite different from functional programming just because the the paradigm of the data flow is so different um but yeah this is very much a um inspired by functional programming um what's the phrase functionality performance uh, type thing. Oh, and I forgot the last one. It must be able to hold many, that should say, not many, <laughs> data types for the results. So this is um, very simply, if we're going to make an API for this, it can't only hold numbers. <laughs> we need it to be flexible so people can use it for whatever they want to use it for. So what do we have that does something like this in LabVIEW? Um, notifiers are quite a natural parallel to this. They need a little bit of enhancement. Um, but as we say, we've already seen them used in something like this context in frameworks like DQMH, um, where we use that. And single element queues go for the same thing. When I mentioned this before at CSLUG, I, I think it was Fab who told me she had been told <laughs> single element queues may be more efficient, certainly with memory. Um, you know, either or could work um, um, work perfectly well. And as I say, there is already an implementation in um, Messenger library. Um, the reason why I've built a separate library is, you know, A, frankly, to play with this idea. And the Messenger library is, uh, well, I, I think James has uh, debated the term library versus framework. There's a lot of things that that couples in. What I really wanted is something quite framework agnostic that's really lightweight, and you can just, uh, you know, it could be used by other frameworks, it could be used by you know, spinning up your own framework, or even where you're not using that kind of uh, satisfied framework. Um, but I will say, you know, as I say, Messenger Library has given me some thought you'll see about the right, right and wrong way to do this. So let's have a look at some LabVIEW. Uh, Where's it gone? There we go. That's oh, so a future tokens are single element queues underneath the yeah. air. It's like I say, the really interesting thing doing this is is I don't think there's any like anything too exciting in terms of technology. Uh, it's very conceptual. Yes, Conrad asked about the single element queues. Yeah, I, I believe that what I was told, and I've not tested this, I thought I might get to test it before this, but I haven't. Uh, single element queues might make less data copies than notifiers. Um, so that, that's that's the, the question mark. Well, the question mark's for, because I haven't tested it. Um, but the honest answer is, um, ah, thank you, James. So James Powell says, notifiers are like single element queues with extra copies functionality, including a forced copy. So there you go. So what I've done is made a library. Um, it's, let me show you an example first. So this is the basic idea, and, and I feel like I could make this prettier. Oh, and I didn't think about LabVIEW and zoom in. Um, uh, let's see if I have a way to 
<laughs> I don't know why. It's, it's been too long since we've had an event, and I didn't think that was right. I'm going to do something really odd, and I'm going to screenshot this and blow it up. And if anyone can remind me, Microsoft Zoom it. As I say, I know there's some software for this, and I should have thought of it first. <laughs> right. <laughs> This is a strange way to do it, but here's the basic idea, and this is why I normally put it on site on slides. Um, so, basically, here we have an asynchronous random number generator. So this internally is a little QMH uh, type system. Um, this is the queue that we're going to use to pass it data, and it can pass us back. Um, it'll either pass us back a result, or if the number is less than 0.1, then it will uh, pass us back an error. And so the idea is when we make the request, we generate this future, and then we can sit and, and read this future. And this will return us either a value as a variant. So the variant is, unfortunately, the way that I'm getting around handling multiple types. Um, or it will return us an error for the result. And just to prove that it actually works, if we run this a few times, sometimes we'll get an error, sometimes we'll get a result. And the way that this works under the hood, uh, yes, so Gabriel, so yeah, the future read here is blocking. Um, oh, and I'll just address John's, see John's question, because I was thinking about this this morning. Would user events provide a nice mechanism? I like user events. I thought about it in terms of integration. I think they kind of break the concept with this, though, of it being quite ephemeral. Um, but it's a temporary value, whereas user events have a more permanent feel to them. Although, like you say, with dynamic registration, there's, there's, there's things you can do. But again, you're now going around a loop multiple times. So you've got now some extra state to handle as well in user events. So that's why I've, I've avoided them. Um, so what happens under the hood is, uh, you know, what, I'm gonna. This is gonna be awful, isn't it? Let me quickly see how quick Zoom it will install. Can you use uh, magnifier, and you can change the the view to land like with control alt and Oops. Oh, awesome! Thank you. I thought there was something built in there as well. Yeah, I. Uh, let's see if. It, uh, I do it so into my version of Windows, but ah, there we go. Ooh, right. Let me put, work this out. Okay, well that's better though. <laughs> um, so here's the idea. So the in the middle here we've oh, <laughs> mustn't lose the mouse there. Uh, in the middle here we've got the notifier. We've got the queued request, and here I've got a notifier so we can do request replies. So we can compare the two in a minute. Um, but we also have this uh, promise. So what happens is there's this VI here, and this creates a future and promise pair, and then we pass the promise to the um, to the, the the asynchronous loop, so it has something to respond on. Underneath what this is doing, and this is where some of the interesting bit comes in. So what I wanted to uh, try here was to have this separate API for future and the promise. And so what we do is underneath is something called a result, which is a wrapper around a notifier. So that handles our communication. And then we create a, both a future and a promise from this result. So the main reason why I think there is value in having these is that then the APIs can start to represent and enforce the behavior that we want. And I was thinking about this earlier. I think you probably could do it with one class anyway, one term anyway. Um, but for example, here, so when we read the future, there's no output. So we're trying to reinforce that idea that once you've read the future, it's gone. And the same for the promise. So if we look in our number generator, um, there's two methods, resolve with result and resolve with error. And again, there's no output. So I kind of quite like having them as separate APIs because they've got essentially different users, right? There's two different use cases. Um, 
but I'm I could be swayed. Let's put it that way. <laughs> I'm not totally sold on that, um, but I do like having the separate API uh, for, for both of them and separating the two sides of that. And so yeah, so we can see on this end, I put a hundred millisecond wait, and then we ran generate a random number. Uh, well, there's no data flow, but you know what I mean. Um, and then the yeah, asynchronous can re resolve with error, resolve with the result, and that's just a variant input as well. And yeah, if we look underneath what it's doing, end of the result, it's just a notifier at the minute. I, I think I probably tried a single element queue, um, but I started with notifier, so I thought they'd help elsewhere. Um, and it's standard kind of message format. Uh, in this case, we have, is it, uh, I did put in an unresolved so we could detect, have a, uh, I'll, I'll show why in a minute, um, or it's an okay value or an error value. So that's all we're doing underneath. But yeah, the separate APIs, the cost of that is this extra level of abstraction that, that seems a little bit pointless to be fair. So let's... Uh... There's a couple of questions from Gabriel about Gabriel about names for queues and malleable APIs. Um, so yes, there is no name for the queue. We don't have a unique name. We just don't specify one when we create it. Um, and so then uh, uh, um, LabVIEW guarantees that, that, that they're unique. Because again, each of these futures should live on their own. Malleability for variants, yes. So I started this in 2017, and that's very much with an eye on malleable. Um, at the very least, you could use malleable VR. Uh, you could use variants internally and have this read function be able to do the conversion internally. I've done that before. Um, in terms of making the whole API malleable, if you like, you could do it if you, rather than having a wrapper, here, if instead you actually expose the notifier reference. The reason I haven't done that is because, as I say, there, there may be better ways to do the internals of this. And so I wanted to keep the encapsulation so I can try a single element queue, for example. Um, so that's the main, main reason not to do that um, at the minute. I think it's the right thing to do, but I really dislike no, that's not fair. Uh, I, I like strict typing. Strict typing solves a lot of bugs, and so it does pain me slightly to to build it all on variants. But there's an awful lot of complexity that comes with with adding strict typing to something like this. Um, so let's show another example. Oops, no, that's my sub VI. So just to highlight the potential performance benefit, here I've got the same idea. We've got, but we've got two number generators. We're going to make two requests, one after the other. And then if we're using the futures, we do this read all function. And what the read all function allows us to do is um, basically queue up multiple uh, futures for this. And again, this is where actually a lot of the functionality is in the results. So we're going to pull out the results. Uh, and what this is basically doing is just blocking on the read one by one, reducing the timeout so we get a standard overall timeout, um, and then doing some handling of that result depending on if we see any timeouts or not. I'm going to come back to um, this likely, this a little bit um, when we talk about the API design. But this was really important for me because I think this is uh, one of the big benefits. And, and that's kind of what really inspired me uh, out of the Messenger library version as well, because it has this kind of functionality and it was, it was very useful. Um, so, yeah, so if we, so because each of these takes 100 milliseconds, um, if we use the notifiers for the wait and reply, we're going to see this take about 200 milliseconds. <laughs> have I got something debugging, or have I broken something this morning? Ah, I oh know. 
I don't know what this is. Hang on, let me try that again. <laughs> All right, I've broken something and tidying up. Or something blocked somewhere. Ah, well, that's a shame. I'll have to have a quick look at that. That's what happens when you tidy things up at the last minute. Um, what we should see there, what I saw yesterday, was obviously if we're waiting for a reply for each, then the total time is about 200 milliseconds. It's the sum of the two values. By not waiting on each one and using the futures, uh, we can get the um, uh, we, we can get the benefits of the asynchronous asynchronicity and, and it'll take it just over 100 milliseconds and yes i'm pleased to see gabrielle and james you've highlighted this perfectly which is versus another message uh here the order is guaranteed because we've got a future for every request so i can say for this request this was the response whereas if we're just sending messages back we don't you don't know which message corresponds to which request unless you start adding unique ids or something like that um, so yeah, I'm pleased that, that that's come out. And I'll just zoom that so people can see actually. Um, yeah, so in this case, we know because we're building it into an array and the array is ordered that the first output, I mean, I'm not doing anything with it here, but out of here, we get an array of results. So the first output of that array is, um, it is gonna be our uh, first request. The second output will be the second request. Uh, is there anything else interesting on? Oh, yeah, actually, let, let's just have a look at the wait function because that's interesting from a technology point of view. Because I thought, mistakenly, um, the notifiers already did await all, but they don't really. So, this I'm not totally happy with, but it works for now. Um, so, we use a notifier and what this doesn't do well is tell us um, if it's already been resolved by the time we get to this point. So there could be a race condition there. So first, we actually have to use get status. And that's why I have that unresolved status. So we can see if it's unresolved. If, it's, if it is unresolved, then we'll wait on notification here. And we're just going to use that for um, uh, blocking on that. If it has been resolved, then great. We don't need to block. We'll just go and read that out. And depending on the type, we'll either cast the value to an error or to the actual value. Um, if it time, we do allow for a timeout. So this is something that I've been questioning a little bit. Uh, we'll we'll jump through the design slides in a minute. Oh no, we might as well talk with it on the screen. Most of the futures APIs I've worked with don't have timeouts, uh, and the reason is, is because it's seen as this asynchronous task in the runtime engine, it's almost seen like, well, you wouldn't have a timeout on a function. But because this is a little bit more roll your own, you know, something could go wrong in that asynchronous message loop. So I do think having a timeout so the program doesn't hang is important. Um, the other question is, because of the, you know, these are supposed to be short lived, these futures, if it times out, should you be able to retry it? And that is a really interesting question that I haven't decided upon yet. There's a bit of me that thinks if you're using these, you should just stick a long time out on it, you know, 60 seconds uh, or something like that. And if the task doesn't com come back to you, then you don't know whether that task has failed outright or it's just being slow. So you should probably just start the task again. Um, but I have to say, I've been conservative to start with, and I do allow retries in this API at the minute. Um, a big factor behind this is when I was using Messenger, I remember that I did use timeouts on futures. <laughs> so I obviously had a, thought I had a use case for it then. Um, but uh, yeah, I, that, that's something that, that's a bit of a, a question mark for me. Uh, Gabriel's commenting on passing futures to a third process. I guess that would be your object result. Why? Maybe. Uh, yeah. So if you so if you wanted to kick off a process here and then pass it to another process to wait for the future, 
that could be done. Um, there's no technical reason not to do that. I would worry slightly that it slightly breaks the uh, concept a little bit. Um, the idea here is that this is like a, a task of this process. Um, so it feels a little strange to me, but there's no technical blocker for it if there's a good reason for it. Um, I, I can't see any reason why not. Uh, and I also saw so Fab made a comment about uh, you could uh, I'll break out that yeah, find the original yeah. comment. You can get the answer to the one that finishes first and abort the rest. So, yes, and that's something that can be done with futures. Um, I haven't built it into this API, but there is. Um, I've seen the API in other languages where it's just return me the one that finishes first. Um, I also haven't built in an ability to abort a task here, but actually, I wonder if that might be an interesting addition. Um, but I like to keep things simple and. To be frank, you know, to give you an idea, this isn't technically complex at this point. This is four hours work, eight hours work, maybe. Um, yeah, you know, th there's a lot more that can be done with it. Um, but I think for LabVIEW, the wait all, the read all is, is the really important bit, because I think that's where we're going to see the gains. And in fact, as Fab says, we have another way to do that if we want to do that. <laughs> Uh, so third process as we did. Um, I think you're up to date on the, the chat window as well. Cool. All right. So we've got like 10 minutes left. Which is, is, it, that's it. Um, is there anything else in the code to look at? I don't think so. We can jump back in if there's more questions that need it. So that's, that's, that's my library. Um, it's up on GitHub. I'm probably going to have a little bit more of a fiddle with it, but it's open to be played with. Um, and the questions I've been asking there and the questions I'm going to ask now, I really am interested in in feedback because, uh, yeah, you know, I really think having a future concept in my view could be really useful um, to both framework developers and to, to, to normal developers who are playing with asynchronous loops. I just think it's much clear you know it, it gives you i like to think it gives you the best of both worlds i think it gives you the performance of having asynchronous messaging um versus the the clarity well it's, it's a bit less clear than request and reply but it's it's closer to that uh so i've asked does, does it mean the futures are just used as a blocking mechanism well what if we'd like to get the response and actors method so it can't be blocked uh, I'm not sure I fully follow the question, but let me attempt it and tell me if, if, if I don't answer it. Um, so yeah, futures are a blocking mechanism, basically. If, if you were just going to have one request and then block on the response, then it's going to be the same as um, request and reply. Um, where futures really come in, I think, in lab view, is if you have got those multiple requests. So like you say, um, you want to queue up multiple things and be sure in the order of the responses. I think that's the real use case in LabVIEW. Um, in other languages, they do a little bit more than blocking. They do some thread management, and there's, there's other things that go on there. But we don't have that in, in LabVIEW right now. That, that involves actually having a more asynchronous runtime under the hood. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's the kind of use case. Hopefully that answers it. But yeah, just, just put another post up if not. Uh, Holger Brand, promise and future, new names for well-known concepts. Um, yeah, in a sense, I think I, I would argue differently. It's, it's, it's a new concept for well-known technology, <laughs> I would argue. I say notifiers, queues. You know, waiting on response. It's all been there in LabVIEW before. But every, what I think is useful is to put a language and a concept. You know, it's just like, it's just the same thing with framework. You know, why add Active Framework over QMH? By putting in a common language and structure, um, it makes it easier for us to talk about that, understand the boundaries, what can be done, what can't be done, what's good practice, what's bad practice. So, yeah, there's no, you know, <laughs> Yeah, no to technological prowess here, really. It's it's much more just about um, 
putting a bit of structure around the existing technology uh, so that we have a common language and a common understanding of, 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 of the bounds of that. <laughs> Uh, so Eric's question, it sounds like futures might be useful if your application needs to respond to other things while waiting for the promise to fulfill. If you input futures on request the application needs in order to reply, then you risk just querying the await a lot, right? And uh, so Eric, uh, yes, if, if all you're doing is requesting and then waiting, there's going to be no difference between using a future and using like the request reply in DQMH or, uh, or Active Framework. It, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Um, where they really will come in it's not so much about it's not really about if you need to reply to other messages it's about if you need responses from multiple other actors or multiple other loops that's where you're going to see um the performance benefits or the the, the benefits of the, the futures um if it's just one of the loop request reply you don't need them. <laughs> it's not going to help Um, cool, I think that's... I don't know if you want to say something about this, but Joseph Tag about six messages up, said something about uh, state management of sequences with a QMH, oh, yes. and Fabiola responded to that five messages ago. Perfect. Well, it, yeah, I think Fab's bang on, of course. And yes, Joseph, exactly that. It's about, you know, we state management in, in QMH is just... Uh, especially for something that doesn't live for the lifetime of the QMH, I find just gets messy. So this allows us to push things back to data flow. Um, if you've seen a few of my previous presentations, you, you, you may be aware that that's always been the thing that's irked me about, you know, more and more asynchronous stuff is, oh, we've got this data flow and it's great. And the more we break away from it, the harder program gets to comprehend. So this is a way to hopefully uh, bring things back to data flow a little bit while still getting the benefits of asynchronous. Um, another name for asynchronous callback messages, right? Yeah, essentially that's right. It's a different way of accessing asynchronous res results. Um, so, so asynchronous is, <laughs> is the really important term here, and we're doing asynchronous, you know, already in LabVIEW. Um, whether that's asynchronous call and collect or call and forget, um, you know, at the real kind of language level. But every time you implement, you know, interacting. Uh, actors or QMHs, you're doing asynchronous programming. And that's, again, why I wanted to, to address this, is with doing asynchronous programming, these other languages have technologies and, uh, and you know, language and concepts around asynchronous programming. So let's, let's borrow some of that um, that's, that's been, been well proven in many, many other languages. Cool. So let me. Yeah, we haven't got too long left, but I'll just do. So some interesting questions. I, I probably touched on these anyway. I think futures and timeouts. I think James said, yeah, timeouts can be a, a, a talk in itself, and he's absolutely right. Um, I, I went through this. I think they need timeouts. You don't want hanging software. I'd like to think you shouldn't be using the timeouts unless something's really gone wrong. Um, but I think we need them. Uh, spoke about this API separation of promises and futures. I, th I think there's a value in it, um, but I'd love feedback on it. I, I um, can certainly see it, you know, as this evolves, being able to separate those two APIs would be a useful thing. <laughs> and this should have been the one before. Uh, related to timeouts, is should a future be retried? So um, this was one of the things that got me with Messenger Framework was if one of them timed out, and in hindsight, I should have just set timeouts higher. <laughs> um, but if something went wrong in the process and it timed out, um, I couldn't retry the other methods. And so I've gone for including retries, but I could easily be persuaded to um, say, no, you should never retry it. If it times out, you should go back and try the whole process again, because some things obviously gone fundamentally wrong in the asynchronous loop. Uh, Gabrielle asks, is there a lot of overhead in creating a new queue and destroying it for each request? Um, 
That would probably depend on your definition of a lot. Um, it's definitely a concern. I'm at this point assuming because this basic technique is used in a lot of other frameworks that it's probably pretty minimal. Uh, it would have been adjusted in those frameworks if there was a big problem with it. Um, there is overhead, and you know, one thing I've considered a little bit is performance. But you know, essentially, I think these aren't ever going to be a super high performance way of moving data because we've got to use variance, or you know, maybe if we can remove variance, uh, then maybe there's a way to improve the performance a lot. But because you've got to create and destroy that queue as well, you know, this isn't going to be used for streaming a whole bunch of data. Um, so that that's the um, my thoughts on performance with this at the minute is is it's it should be pretty performant. It's not going to be slow, but it's not going to be top performance either. All right, this was an interesting one. So I think I showed you. Um, And yeah, James is right. Not destroying a future on time. It's a great potential for memory leak. And that's the big problem with what I'm doing right now is if there's a timeout, there's nothing, again, in that API design to force you to say, I don't want this future anymore. Um, so yeah, that, that, there, there is an interesting um, balance with timeouts, memory management, things like that, that, that needs to be, be worked out. Um, yes, operational errors. Now, this would be a really interesting one for feedback. So go away and have a, a bit of a thing. And let me explain what I mean by this. I've talked about typing. So we can just do this, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so when you read a future, uh, let me see if I can bring up context help. You get a separate set of errors for errors from the task versus uh, operational errors. You know, there's some problem with the future. I think that's useful, um, and it's an easy one to resolve because if you want them to end up in the same place, you just do a merge errors on the output. Um, on the promise, you do a, you also have them separated, and I do wonder if there's a case for actually a third API call, which is um, you know, if there's an error on the normal error in, then resolve to an error. Otherwise, resolve the value. Um, but I also think there's a there's a case for a split with that because in that QMH you might have, you know, I've got a local error which doesn't affect the task, and so I want to treat that separately. The only errors we want to pass back on the future are problems with the actual task in hand. Um, but that's an interesting question. Is is quite what the error handling should look like um, on that. So with that, we're at time, slightly over. Apologies. So uh, those are good discussion, which I love to see. Um, I think we have to vacate this, quote, room um, <laughs> for the next people to be able to come in. So we have the breakout room, and I've already forgotten what color we're in. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Red. So if you head to the, the red breakout room, I'll go and hang out in there. and. Happy to show more code, discuss it further, whatever kind of makes the most sense.